Hi everybody, welcome all to this uh, virtual Civil computational biology seminar series. Um, today we have the pleasure to um, welcome Mark Robinson from the Statistical Bioinformatic, Bioinformatics Group at uh, the Institute of Molecular Life Science, the University of Zurich. Um, Mark studied uh, applied mathematics and statistics in Canada at the University of Guelph and British Columbia. Uh, then, uh, from 2001 to 2005, uh, Mark worked as research assistant and research scientist at the University of Toronto uh, in Canada on microarray data analysis. Uh, Mark completed his PhD in bioinformatics and biostatistics in 2008 at the University of Melbourne in Australia, um, working on methods for the analysis of GCMS-based metabolic metabolomics data. Uh, he has also, during that time, been involved on different other projects, uh, such as comparison of an affymetrix uh, platforms, uh, differential expression for count data, and normalization of RNA-seq data. From 2008 to 2011, he worked as a postdoctoral post research officer in cancer epigenetics at the Garvin Institute and at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. He then moved uh, to Europe and set up his own group. Uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Zurich and is also a group leader at the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. Um, his groups uh, develop statistical methods and uh, software tools for uh, interpreting high throughput sequencing and other genomic technologies in areas such as genome sequencing, gene expression and regulation, as well as an analysis of epigenomes. So today, Mark will share with us his work on modern RNA-seq differential expression analysis. Uh, Mark, thank you again for accepting this invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you and thanks for having me and thanks Diana for the, the invitation to come and also for the introduction. Um, so I would like to talk about modern uh, RNA-seq differential analyses and I guess, well, I'll explain what that means, what I mean by modern, but there's been a, a few recent innovations that are worth uh, discussing. They introduce some, some new and interesting challenges for us. Um, just before I begin, I just want to uh, highlight the, the people that were involved in this work. And uh, of course, in Lausanne, people are very familiar with the first author of this, uh, Charlotte Sonson. She was here for um, uh, a few years, and uh, it's great to have her in Zurich. Um, and also, just to, just to say that everything I'm going to talk about today is, uh, well, more or less in this, in this paper. And, and also, just to point out, this is kind of a new model or, or a new um, uh, um, a new way for, for my lab is, is this open uh, well, post-publication review. So uh, this, this paper that I'm going to talk about and, and, and this sort of modern differential expression analysis um, is uh, published in F1000 research. And this is, a, this is an interesting model that we just tried out for this project. And, and it's been quite a success. It's been quite a positive experience. Um, and also to acknowledge Mike Love, who in theory is my uh, competitor. He's one of the main, auth the, the, the main authors of the DEC2 package. Um, but we, uh, as we were going through this project, we found that he was working on something similar uh, a few months previous, and so we, we got together and tried to uh, bring a unified voice to, to some of the opinions that we have, which I'll, which I'll discuss throughout the talk. <clears throat> um, okay, so, uh, so here's the outline to the talk. So I want to give a brief history of what we do with RNA-seq data, and I'm really going to focus on differential expression analysis. Of course, there's lots of other things you can do with RNA-seq data, um, but I won't speak about those today. And then, I'll, uh, of course, uh, modern is in the title, so I want to tell you what is new in RNA-seq analysis. That's, that's kind of the, the main point here. Um, and, and what this brings us to is, well, I guess what I hope people will take away from this is that they really think about what you actually want to ask of your RNA-seq data. Um, and it's not so easy um, uh, when, when you really think about it. It's, it's, it's a bit complicated. And, and then also I want to highlight some of the, the other things, some subtleties that come up in the, in the analysis. And uh, I'll give you some of my opinions and then talk about a, a couple open questions. Um, and, and so just to motivate this, um, uh, and I don't want you to think that uh, my research program is motivated by social media, um, but this was an interesting blog post that came, came about uh, late last year. Um, and it caught our attention because it's kind of a, a shock and awe title, but it's also something that we've been thinking about and studying in our lab. And so, uh, I guess what I hope to answer or, or, or show to you today is that we're not really doing anything wrong. There's, there's not 
Uh, there's not a major crisis here. Uh, but there are some issues that are worth discussing and, and worth kind of teasing out. And, and I, of course, the, the story's not over. Even though RNA-seq has been, along, been, been around for quite a long time, uh, there are still some open questions. Um, and uh, just to, to, to jump to the spoiler here, the, at least this controversy is really about how people count their, their reads and quantify um, uh, transcriptional outcomes. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get into this in, in more detail more about union counting versus transcript counting. And that'll be clear in a few minutes if you don't already know what that means. OK, so here's my brief, uh, brief history. Um, and so I think people are probably familiar with uh, RNA-seq. Um, but I'll just step through it just for completeness. So you start out with some kind of uh, population of cells. And I guess nowadays you can even do this at the single cell level. Um, and then you need to make a few choices. I guess the two common choices are you select for poly A transcripts, um, or you deplete the ribosomal RNA. Uh, so you make one of those two choices, depending on what you want to see, and then go through all the preparation steps, um, fragment into small pieces, um, <coughs> reverse transcribe, add some adapters, and sequence on a very large scale. And this is where, I guess, um, we kind of take over. Um, although, in theory, we're, we're also involved at the design stage. Um, and and I've, I've condensed RNA-seq differential analysis into three main points. So uh, there's a, a mapping process, and then there's this counting. I put count in quotes because, well, there's different ways to do that, and, and, uh, and there's some details there. And then I guess my real area of research is in the, in the, in the statistical side, computing um, differential expression statistics. And that gets a little bit complicated because we're often working in very small samples. And so we want to do the best we can with very small numbers of experimental units. Typical is uh, three replicates of one condition versus three replicates of another condition. And that's kind of a hard statistical inference problem, but we do what we can to, to improve on those. And also just to say uh, briefly that, you know, of course, RNA-seq is used for lots of other things. Uh, you can discover new transcripts or new isoforms of existing genes. You can do some analysis by, you can partition the reads that you see according to allele and look at allele-specific expression and, and uh, even look at um, RNA editing and, and, and various other things. Um, so so let's, uh, let's just jump right to the, the heart of the, the bioinformatics problems. And so I mean, this is where people start to, uh, um, well, disagree. Um, and so there's, there's various, um, various things here. So if you look at the mapping, I'll get into this, uh, uh, all of these steps in a, in a little more detail. Um, you can, you have maybe roughly two choices there. You can do full alignments, so take your reads and, and fully align them. Or there's this relatively new business of pseudo alignment, um, and that uh, is just simply 10 to 20 times faster, so that's quite, um, quite an innovation at this stage of the game. Uh, but there's some caveats of both of these, and so we'll, we'll discuss a bit of those. Um, I guess one of the main issues is counting. So. There's really two distinct schools of thought here, and um, some bioinformaticians get quite um, uh, energetic about uh, expressing their views on this. Uh, and, and I must say that I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of an Exxon union counter, and I've now moved over to being a transcript counter. Um, but I should say that most of that is because it's faster, not because it's necessarily uh, mind-blowingly better. Um, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And then, uh, so statistics, I guess this is my main area of research. Um, and so because the data accounts, it's a digital technology, you're counting things. Uh, things like negative binomial or Poisson models are, are prominent here. And I'm not going to go into all the details of those, but uh, there are various related statistical issues that come up. OK, so let's talk about the first thing, and that's this mapping business. So on the left-hand side is, well, just a schematic of uh, the, the, the cDNA that you sequence and the small reads that you get. Um, and really the trick there is, I mean, people have doing, been doing sequence alignments for decades, so there's not anything remarkably new here other than we want to do this on a very large scale. Um, and so there's some advanced data structures that people use. Um, and I must say that this is also not my area of, of research. I'm really a beneficiary of, of uh, very good methods that are available to us in the public domain. And I guess the one main trick there is that you need to have, a, have an aligner that's gap aware, such that when you have a read that goes over an exon exon junction, it properly maps that. And there's various ways of doing this. You can map to the transcriptome, map to the genome, and add some extra pieces to the genome, and, and do it that way. There's lots of, lots of um, ways to do this. And this is um, kind of 
uh, yeah, like I said, there's lots of nice tools available to you. So relatively new is um, this approach here where everything's kind of shrunk into capers. So you take your original transcript catalog, assuming you have a transcript catalog, uh, but for organisms like human, mice, Drosophila, they have very good catalogs. Take those, uh, the reference transcripts there, condense those into camers, and then also take the reads and condense those into camers, and then do all the matching on the camer scale. And the reason you want to do this is because it's a lot faster. Um, and so just to give you a perspective of the speed, on the left-hand side here, we're talking, you know, for some of the samples we have, it's probably an hour worth of compute time across a multi-core server. Whereas on the, on the right here, uh, just your average laptop would be about 10 minutes. So, I mean, this is a pretty, pretty big innovation for 2014. And uh, so I guess the main players there are, are the Sailfish tool, uh, but also the same author has a tool called Salmon, and then uh, Leo Pachter's lab has uh, Callisto. So there's a few um, methods with this kind of ideology that, that are getting used. And, and so the main thing is that they're fast, and, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, their um, accuracy and so on. Okay, so here's where it gets controversial and people get really excited about um, their particular method and so on. And, and so, um, so like I said, there's kind of two schools of thought here. And the first school of thought is the union counters, which is kind of the no-brains method. Just sum all the reads that you see um, as they land in, in different places on the gene. So it's kind of taking the union of all of the exons of the gene and count the reads that fall in those places. And then there's the transcript counters where they try to um, basically come up with a model that allows you to basically portion off the read. So um, just some of these examples here. Um, on the left here, you've got some reads here. You've got two different transcripts of a given gene. These reads here, you don't actually know whether they come from the red transcript or from the blue transcript. But using an EM algorithm uh, and a model for this, and you can model various features of the data, various biases and so on, you can basically portion off your reads and estimate what the transcripts are. And one of the, the main claims of the transcript counting approach versus the union counting approach is that well, union counting is going to be bad in certain situations. And here's a couple of those situations. Um, so for example, what you can see here is there's 10 total reads here and 10 total reads here. So if you were a union counter, you would say, OK, well, there's no difference. So it's just a log of 10 over 10. There's a, the, the log full change is 0. Now, if you were to do proper counting of the transcripts, well, you know that there's kind of a sharing of, of blue transcripts and red transcripts here. But then over here, you're, you're shifted all the way towards the, the red transcripts. And I guess one thing that's, of course, well known with RNA-seq is that the longer your transcript, then on average, the more fragments you're going to get from that transcript, assuming the same expression level. And so if you, uh, if, if you wanted to count the total output of this gene, you should do a proper counting of this. And, and so in this case, this is where the, the expression is actually more coming out of condition B than condition A after you account for the fact that um, the, the transcripts are different sizes. So, so, so the total output of the locus in condition B is higher than in condition A. And that would be missed if you just do the simple counting. And so that's, that's, uh, that's a fair point. Um, and, and the reverse also happens. So there's cases where, um, in this case, we have 10 reads here and 5 reads here. And so that says there's a log full change, or there's a two-fold change, um, if you just do naive counting. But in fact, if you count for the length of these transcripts, Blue is a lot longer. It's exactly twice the length of the red transcript. Um, you can see that, well, in fact, there is no, no change, change in, in expression. And so that's, uh, so if you do this proper counting, then, uh, well, there's no change. Whereas if you do simple counting, there's a change. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is the whole argument. Um, and, and I think, well, I'm not sure the reason why people stick uh, passionately to union counting, um, but, uh, but I guess it's, it's just been easier uh, until recently when these new tools came along. Okay, so that's the kind of overview of counting, so just so you know that these issues, uh, these issues exist. Um, now I'm going to kind of jump to the differential expression problem. And here's where it also gets a, a, a bit confusing. Um, and so uh, I just want to lay it out in fairly simple terms and, and basically encourage you to define what the problem is. Um, and, and so I'm going to throw around a lot of terms for the rest of the talk. Um, things like differential transcript expression versus differential gene expression. 
uh, and then I'm going to use these symbols DTE and DGE, and, and these are going to come up again and again in the talk. So um, spend a, spend a, a few seconds and try and memorize these with me. Um, the idea for differential transcript expression is you want to ask the question: Does the blue transcript change from condition A to condition B? And then repeat the same task for transcript B. Does it change from A to B? Um, and then do that for all of the transcripts that you see that are expressed in, in your data set. Um, that's one question you might ask. Uh, but you could also ask, it, ask uh, a different question from the same data. You can say, well, what is the total output of this locus? And that's what I'm going to call differential gene expression. So essentially, you, you sum these up. And uh, the trick here is to sum it up in an appropriate way so that you get the kind of total output of this gene in condition A and condition B. And it looks like, in this case, I've, I've kind of made a, made a guess here, but there's definitely more coming out of condition A than in condition B, assuming this, these are on kind of a, a scale that can be compared. Um, just to uh, turn the screws a little bit, um, what if you think about differential transcript usage? Now, it's a slightly different, uh, different thing. And what I'm thinking about here in differential transcript usage is, well, uh, if you look at proportionally how much comes from the blue versus the, the, the yellow transcript, or green, I'm not sure, um, you can see that, well, maybe two-thirds of it is blue in this case, whereas in this case, maybe only one-third of it is blue. Um, and you can also take this and also kind of translate this to differential gene expression. So I mean, what I'm really trying to point out here is that, well, what is the question you actually want to ask of your RNA-seq data? Because different questions will lead to different statistical tools and statistical methods. And uh, I mean, maybe that's completely obvious, but it wasn't even to me when I, when I first saw it kind of expressed in this way. And so there's basically the point is, is that there's a lot of different ways to ask the question. And once you know what the question is, there's even a lot of different ways to answer that question with, with um, statistical methods. Um, and just to take this one step further, although quite related, um, there is, uh, for, for people that are interested in differential transcript usage, and what I mean by that is you're really interested in whether the proportions change, um, then one fairly good way to do that is actually um, project everything into exons and start looking at exon differences. And uh, just to highlight that um, Charlotte also just finished off a study to compare different methods to do differential transcript usage as a, as a separate problem. Um, and it turns out that the exon counting business seems to seems to work quite well in that situation. Um, and so anyways, just to say that there's all these different ways of doing the analysis. There's one more coming. Um, but just to say, uh, just to, to point out, differential transcript expression is different from differential gene expression is different from differential transcript usage. It's a different way to ask the question. OK. So, um, so I guess the, the, the question then for getting a little bit closer to the statistics is what, what inference could you do or should you do? Uh, and, and I'm probably not in a position to tell you what you should do, but I, but I can tell you what you could do. Um, so, uh, so I guess what you need to ask yourself is what do you want to know? And so I've kind of spelled out a few of these. So there's differential transcript expression. So that's doing everything at the transcript level. There is differential gene expression. So you kind of collapse all the information you get from the transcripts to the gene. You just need to do that in the most appropriate way, because different transcripts have different lengths. So you can't just add the counts. You need to add kind of the suggested counts, like I showed you in, in the schematic example before. Um, another thing that we tried, uh, didn't know how well it was going to work, is you can ask a slightly different question. So from your transcript level information, you can say, well, is there any transcript in this gene that is differentially expressed. Now, that's a slightly different question than asking, is every transcript different in, in this gene? And so what I'm talking about there is that's collapsing also to the gene, but collapsing it in a different way. That's more, I think, I guess you could think there about collapsing uh, transcript level p-values into a gene level p-value. And that's maybe a reasonable thing to do, depending on the question that you want to answer. Uh, and then uh, differential transcript usage or differential exon usage, now, that's more about asking the questions, the transcript proportions change. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so if we come back to our, our schematic example before, uh, when we, I've, I basically answered this question. Has the blue transcript changed from condition A to condition B? Yes, it has. It was here, and it was absent here. Has the red one changed? Yes, it was absent here. It was, um, it was present here. 
have any of the transcripts changed? Well, yes, that's, that's kind of a natural follow-on from this one. If there's a yes here, then there's a yes here. Has the overall expression changed? No, the overall expression is not changed because 10 reads for a long transcript is equal to five reads from a short transcript. So the overall outcome, the overall production of transcripts from this locus have not changed. Um, and then have the proportions changed? Yes, well, it's 100 and zero here, and it's a zero and 100 there. Okay, so this is obviously a, a, a very easy example. In most situations, uh, it's gonna be a lot more difficult than this. There's gonna be a lot more transcripts. There's gonna be a lot more uh, uncertainty in, in all of this. Uh, but anyways, that's kind of just spelling out what you could do. I'm going to later make a few recommendations about what you should do, but I, I may not really be in a position to tell you what you should do. Um, okay, so there's lots of subtleties here, um, in case you haven't uh, noticed them or picked up on them. Um, so I guess the, the, one of the main reasons people stick to union counting is that it's easy. Um, one kind of... Uh, uh, quick there is that uh, if your transcript catalog is incomplete, you might question how well the estimation of transcript expression is. Um, I, I don't show that later, but there, there are certain concerns. There's probably lots of cases where we don't know the full transcript catalog. So how well do all these transcript estimators work if, you're, if, if, if you don't have a complete catalog? Uh, we can simulate a bit of that, um, and we did a bit in that study. Um, on the flip side, I mean, basically, it's, it's quite clear that transcript counting is the way to go. It's, it's, it's more accurate and it's more, it's, it's more precise. Um, but you can also imagine in very complicated genes, um, think about some MHC genes, you have hundreds of isoforms. Pretty hard to distinguish from reads which of those isoforms is really, is really, is really different. And so there's, um, uh, we'll come back to a bit, that a bit later. Uh, so there's kind of some trade-offs here, and so so maybe it's it's uh, um, well, it's worth thinking about what you, what you actually want to do. Um, another thing is that there's more transcripts than genes. So what does that mean? That means that uh, if you were to do testing at the transcript level versus the gene level, there's more statistical tests. Uh, there's possibly well, there's definitely a higher multiple testing penalty problem um, uh, or t testing penalty. And maybe that leads to lower sensitivity, but it's, it's not clear. It also, again, depends the, the actual situation that you're looking for, whether, uh, whether that affects sensitivity or not. Um, one question I get a lot is, and I'll come back to this later, is do the standard statistical methods that we've been using for kind of raw counts, uh, do they apply to these estimated counts? So with this transcript level counting, you're, uh, you, you basically have an estimated count. So it's not, it's not kind of a... a um, the, the simple situation, there's some uncertainty involved there. Uh, and the short answer is, it's yes, they do. Uh, but there's more, there's more to the story. Um, and so, so here's getting to one of my arguments later. Uh, if a transcript changes, so say you were doing analysis and you were doing it at the transcript level, and one of your transcripts came up as differentially expressed. Uh, I, I pulled many biologists on this, and they say when that happens, they probably want to look at the other transcripts within the gene. Because they want to know, is this transcript changing because the whole output of this gene is changing? So all the transcripts are going up. Or is it changing because it's switching from one isoform to another? Um, and, and so I'll come back to that a bit later. And uh, I, another thing uh, is that there's this whole business, especially with the union counting versus the transcript counting, how big of a deal of this is, is this? How big of a deal? Um, and, and I mean, I guess there's a lot of uh, exaggeration on social media. Um, and I'll try to answer this problem a little bit. Does it matter in practice? Um, and the, the spoiler here is that, well, not so much. Um, <clears throat> but, but there are certain situations where it's worth uh, thinking about. OK. So uh, in the paper that uh, I presented at the beginning, we, we we make some claims or made some claims. Um, and so I'll just jump into all these claims. So we're going to start thinking about, well, maybe we should be thinking about our analysis at the gene level. Depends exactly on the situation. Um, so I'm going to say the actual estimation problem is much easier at the gene level. So that's, that's one argument I will make. Um, I'll give you a little bit of evidence for the fact that the statistical engines work well, whether you do transcript level or gene level, even though there's these raw or estimated counts. Um, and I'll come back to this interpretation thing. I think it's a lot easier to interpret things at the gene level than at the transcript level. 
but I'm also welcome to hear other people's arguments. Um, and then, yeah, the difference between union counting and, and transcript counting is, is mostly small. Okay, so uh, first claim is this, and, and so what we did is we simulated some RNA-seq data, and the way that we like to simulate RNA-seq data is we take a real data set, get some empirical distributions of the, the distribution of uh, abundances that we see, and kind of build that into our, uh, into our data set. And so what I'm plotting here is the estimated transcripts per million versus the truth, because uh, in a simulation we know the truth. And so, I mean, basically, uh, when you do this at the transcript level, there's a set of transcripts that are just really difficult to estimate. So there is some non-trivial amount of expression that we put into the data set, but the algorithms, in this case we're using Simon, um, underestimate the expression. And I think this is just simply because these genes are really hard to estimate. It's not really a, a problem in, in, in Simon, it's a problem in the information that's in the data. Um, and, and so if we do something a little bit easier, and that is take the TPMs and then sum all the TPMs for the transcripts of a gene into a, a gene level summary, then things get a little bit nicer. So we, we still have a few genes that are hard to estimate, and we'll come back to those later. Um, but this is, this is a little bit better. And so if you want to, I mean, this, this maybe argues for the point that maybe you want to do things at the gene level because the estimation is easier. Um, but it also argues for answering an easier problem. So it's, it's, this, is, this is better because it's easier. It's easier to get overall summarized gene level expression than it is transcript level. And on the right here is the devil. This is the, the union counting business. Um, and well, it's actually not so bad, right? Um, highly expressed genes attract a lot of reads. Lowly expressed genes don't attract a lot of reads. So compared against the truth, union counting is not so bad. Um, and you might even favor union counting uh, in these cases where your catalog isn't complete, because if you have at least a transcript that gets most of the exons of a gene, then you're not going to go too far astray. Um, I mean, there are situations where you will, but, but there's a lot of situations where you won't. Um, okay, so that's the first claim. Maybe we should just be doing things at the gene level because it's an easier problem. Um, now, of course, people in certain situations, and I'll come back to these later, uh, will want to look at specific transcripts and whether they, whether they change. Um, so my second claim is that the statistical methods that you use for raw counts and for estimated counts are, uh, well, I say equally healthy here. Uh, I put healthy in quotes because it's not a perfectly healthy p-value distribution. I'm looking at p-value distributions here. The five different panels are five different ways to do this counting. There's two ways uh, that are called the simple, or I guess there's the feature counts and the simple counting. So these are the kind of union approaches. And there's a few different ways to combine the data and, and do the, the kind of proper aggregation of transcript level to the, to the gene level. Um, and, and so what you see here is that, the, I mean, this is just a diagnostic that we do in every, every differential expression analysis just to see whether we get this kind of flat p-value distribution and then a spike at zero. That's what we hope to see. There's a little bit of stuff happening here where we get a little bit, perhaps a little bit of an inflation of the false discovery rate and so on. Um, but this is reasonably healthy. I've seen a lot worse than this, basically. Um, um, but I guess the point here is that whether you do this on the, the estimated counts or the raw counts, you get basically the same profile. Um, so that's an argument for um, suggesting that the methods that you use, the count methods that you use, are, are still OK for these, for these estimated counts. They're still count distributed, and so the assumptions that you make are still reasonably appropriate. The other diagnostic that we look at is um, uh, dispersion mean plots, um, and well, we don't need to, to labor on too much about this, but just to say that regardless of how you um, summarize the data, you get sort of roughly, uh, roughly uh, similar profiles. And, and this, is, this is sort of this business of trying to moderate estimates in the data set to get slightly better inferences uh, by sharing information. Um, and, and so, you know, we use this as just a diagnostic, and it's not so different across the different types of counting. Okay, so let's um, come back to this again. One thing I want to point out again is this little business here of taking your differential transcript expression, but then recording the results at the gene level. So uh, just be careful of the question that we're asking here. Um, uh, you're asking whether any transcript in a gene is, is, is differential. 
Now, one result from the paper is this, and these are plots that we look at a lot, and what you see here is on the, on the y-axis is the sensitivity or the power, the true positive rate, uh, and here is the, the, uh, the false discovery rate. And what a statistician wants you is to control the false discoveries, so you want to keep to the left side, but then you want to be high. Um, and, and so these three dots here that you see, these three open circles, are three different cutoffs of the false discovery rate, and then the, the dot is actually pointed at the, the actual false discovery rate. So for example, this one here I know corresponds to the third cutoff, so I'm setting a 10% false discovery rate, in this particular example, I'm getting you know a 12% actual false discovery rate. So we want to keep things to the left, but keep things to the top. And what I'm comparing here is uh, a gene level analysis versus a transcript level analysis. And so there's there's some statistical advantage to doing things at the gene level, but also keep in mind that what you're doing is you're answering an easier problem again. So it's more powerful to answer an easier question than to answer things at the at, at the transcript level. And that's, that's part, of, part of our argument. Um, and so these are the two questions we're answering. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, and, and so I, I want to, I, I guess, make the argument for which you might choose, which, which might be more informative to you. And I want to make the argument that, to me, it's better to answer two clear questions than one broad question. And what I mean by that is that when you are doing differential transcript expression, you're just saying, does any transcript change? Whereas, if you're, whereas to me, it's a lot clearer if you focus on gene as a unit and answer more specific questions about that gene. Does that gene overall change in its, in its abundance? Does that gene, do the isoforms within that gene switch? Um, and not everyone's on board with this, uh, and, and I accept that. Um, but this is, this, is, this is my thinking. Um, that it's, it's easier to answer um, uh, two precise questions than one, than one broad question. Now, the, the, the counter argument to this is that there's, of course, some situations where you specifically want to do transcript, specific transcript level um, differential expression analysis. This is um, a paper about a, a very specific isoform in prostate cancer that's very predictive of response to treatment to, to this. And this, this was, uh, made a, a little bit of a splash. It was published late 2014. But basically, the presence or absence of this AR7 uh, very specific isoform in prostate cancer is very predictive of whether that isoform is, or whether the, the patients respond to a treatment. And so this would be a very good example of where you'd want to do a very specific analysis on those particular, uh, those particular variants. Um, I'd still question whether you want to do this on, on a genome-wide scale. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so there, are, there are cases where you, where you definitely want to do this. Okay, so uh, for my last time, I need to tell you a little bit about our simulation because we basically made it as extreme as possible um, to, to kind of um, really tease out where things, where this union counting versus transcript counting is really, is really um, causing effect. And so what we did is we took chromosome one just to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, we chose our very typical condition that we see, two experimental conditions, each with three biological replicates. That's like the most popular uh, experiment that we get to analyze. Um, and so we, we, I mean, as we do with the simulations, we put in truly differential things. And what I mean by things is sometimes we put in overall differential expression. So we take all the transcripts and increase their log full change. Or we do it such that the isoform proportions change, but the total output is kept at zero. Um, or we just randomly select transcripts and put them in as, as differential. And, and so this is uh, essentially where you know, we can now tease apart where the union counting versus the transcript counting really makes a difference, and, it, and it's pretty clear. Um, and so again, same sort of, sorts of plots here. Uh, true positive rate versus the achieved false discovery rate. And what you see is that the methods break into two groups. So the, the two lines that are here are the two, what we call simple counting methods, the union counting. Whereas the three methods here, and, and the, th the differences here in these three different methods are just slightly different ways to take the transcript level information and, and put it into the, into the inference machinery. Um, and, and so essentially the union counting, this is where it goes wrong. It's, it's not very good, the performance is really degraded. 
Um, but when you really look at it, it's really due to differential usage. So the, the plots on the right here are this, but split according to the truth whether you have differential transcript usage or not. And basically, if you have no differential uh, transcript usage, then all of these methods are pretty similar. There's a few that kind of fall out a little bit. Um, but, but there's, a, you know, there's several here that are basically in, indiscernible. Whereas the ones that you do have the differential isoform usage, the, the, the proper counting, you're, you're in pretty good shape there. You're getting, well, decent enough power. Um, you're controlling your false discovery rates. Whereas here, the, 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 the union counting, you just really massively throw out your, your false discovery rate. Um, so, so, I mean, this, this is, you know, uh, I guess what partially motivated the switch to, to, uh, to transcript counting, but I, I should also say that um, a lot of it was due to the fact that these things just run a lot faster. Um, just to follow this on, uh, one thing you could do, and you can do this for any data set, is calculate, say you've got this simple situation where you've got uh, two different experimental conditions. You can calculate a log fold change with the simple counting, the, the kind of union-based counting, and you can calculate a log fold change by kind of properly adding that up, uh, the transcript expression to the gene level, and doing a log fold change there. And so we did this for our data set, and that's up here on the top panel, that's scene two, and you can see uh, the, the differential transcript usage um, is, is in red, and the rest are in blue. Of course, we don't know what's truly differential transcript usage in, in the real data sets, we only know it for the simulation data set. And what you can see is this is, this is where things are going wrong. So uh, you can see here that the, on, the, on the y axis here, this is the transcript counting, the log fold change you get. And there's a bunch of log fold changes here that are basically zero, because remember in our simulation, we put in no overall change in expression, but we put in change of the isoforms. And this is where, uh, I mean, this is where the the, the simple counting kind of derails. You get lots of these really extreme log ratios um, that are really just due to the, the differential transcript usage. And, and I mean, when you look back on this, it's actually not, not too surprising. Right? What I'm showing you is not too surprising. Um, what was interesting for us, and, and I don't think the story is finished here, is that, well, what if we did this for real data sets? Because we want to know, if, we're, if we've been doing union counting for the last uh, six or seven years, well, how, how can we trust our, our, our past results? Um, and well, I, I don't think the problem is, is so bad. I mean, there may be a few instances where this, this really goes wrong, but uh, I mean, this, these were just three data sets that we had readily available, but you can do the same exercise on any data set that you want. Um, and, but we don't see the same kind of derailing of the log full changes in the simulated data set than in the real data set. Um, and, and, well, of course, we have to accept that the simulation that we did was pretty, pretty extreme in the end. Um, we, we put in a lot of differential transcript usage. So this is, I guess, part of the argument for saying that, well, it's not such a big deal in many real data sets. Now, there are going to be data sets where there, there are cases where you switch from a long isoform to a short isoform or, or something like that where it really changes things. Um, okay, so um, just to summarize, I just want to talk about some other considerations. I mean, this is... Uh, RNA-seq data in general, uh, differential analyses, um, and just some, some new, some, some old things that you may know about or may want to think about if you were doing these experiments. Um, so, I mean, one thing that makes the transcript expression challenging is that a lot of, a lot of times you have fairly low expression. Um, and so uh, this is just a, a, a review. And in the abstract, it says, genes of interest to pharmacologists are frequently expressed at such low levels that they are not adequately represented in genome-wide. So this may be true, and, and for a grant application, I, I, I just looked at some data sets and said, well, how, how big of a deal is this? And this is what I came up with. And so what I did is I just ranked the genes according to the number of reads they attract. And I did this across a, a couple different data sets. Um, and what it means is basically 80% of your reads go to the top 10% of genes. So that's not a very efficient way to collect data, um, unless you're really interested in all the highly expressed genes. But if you're interested in the more lowly expressed genes, and, and probably there's a lot of situations where you are, uh, not a lot of your real estate goes there. Um, and, and so there's some experimental ways around this. I, I don't know how well they've been received uh, or how well they work overall, 
uh, because it adds another step in the lab and some other cost and so on, it, it may not work out in the end. But essentially, if you could deplete some of these really highly expressed transcripts, maybe some structural proteins that you're not really interested in, maybe you could uh, get a little bit deeper for the kind of same sequencing depth. Um, so I'm not sure that that's all that well appreciated, but it's something that seems um, to stand out pretty strong. Um, a recent paper from Nick Watson's group, just um, kind of coming back to the point that I discussed earlier, some genes are just super difficult, especially if you have very similar gene families. Um, and he did an experiment where he put a thousand reads onto every gene or every transcript and tried to estimate them. And what you see is there's a big spike at a thousand, but then there's a, a long tail to the left where the reads just cannot be kind of unambiguously mapped. Um, and, and so he makes an argument that they're, or they make an argument um, that uh, some of these genes are of disease relevance, and certainly, certainly that's, that's the case. Um, another point that's kind of lingering in the, in the back of my mind uh, is that well, maybe in a few years we're not going to be doing any of this um, fragmenting into small pieces. We're just going to sequence the white transcripts either at a CDM level or even at the RNA level. Uh, this is probably not so far away. This is, this is just a plot of some of our first experience with some PacBio isoseq data, and it was, I mean, it was just brilliant. We had a reference genome, and this particular example at the top here, we had a, this was, this was the annotation, which was inferred by partly RNA-seq data, but also uh, some computational algorithms. And you can see that well, what, what the computational algorithms thought was two transcripts is quite clearly one transcript, and you can see these are reads just across the whole the whole transcripts, and so I mean, this is I mean, at the price point that something like PacBio is, it's more for discovery. But as these technologies get higher and higher throughput, and maybe Oxford Nanopore is really getting close to that point now, um, maybe we can do this in a quantitative way and, and sequence our, our cDNAs and and, um, and and just essentially count at the transcript level makes the makes some of this uh, this business a little bit easier. Okay, and, and so I'm going to just wrap up here uh, to say that, well, there's no real crisis here. We haven't really been doing our RNA-seq all along. Uh, but there are some, you know, there are some uh, cases where this, this business of transcript counting and union counting is, um, is, is large enough to, to think about. Um, this is just my view. Uh, if, unless the need really dictates, I would suggest answering an easier question. So answering questions at the gene level because it's easier to do estimation at the gene level. Answer, are any transcripts differential? Because that's an easier question than answering very specifically about every, every isoform. Um, and so that's why I say I, I find it easier to interpret two precise, two precise questions instead of one broad question. Um, but that also doesn't mean that, that this isn't important. So, the analysis methods for differential transcript expression are actually essential for building into to some of these analyses. Um, and, and so there's, yeah, as I'll say later, there's still a little bit of work to be done. Um, transcript level estimates improve gene level inferences. Um, one question people often ask me is like, what do you do in your lab? Um, and, and so I guess I would say that if you want a fast pipeline, I would combine salmon with edge R, and now you have to uh, take into consideration there's a bit of a bias there, uh, since I'm the co-author of Edger. Uh, but that's, that's what we do in our lab most of the time. Now, one caveat there is that, well, actually, sometimes these full alignments that are computationally costly, they're actually really useful to look at. And, of course, I always encourage people to look at the data. Um, and with these fast pipelines, you just get estimates out. You don't get anything to look at. So these full alignments are actually really useful, especially if you're interested in splicing. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, you might want to slow it down if, 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 if you want to be, be clear about things. Um, one thing I haven't really commented on, but I should say something about, um, is that, you know, these methods are so fast, um, Salmon and Callisto, that you can do bootstraps of the K-Mers to get uncertainty estimates of your, of your transcript level estimates. And um, so the question is what to do with those. Um, and and I, I don't have a, have a full answer because, I mean, basically my argument earlier in the talk is that, well, actually, you just throw away the uncertainties, do your standard edge analysis, and it's still fine. Um, and the reason I think that it's still fine is that most of the genes are actually really, really uh, fairly easy to estimate. So there's not so much uncertainty. It's, it's a very small proportion of the genes that are, um, are a, bit more, uh, a bit more uncertain to estimate. But of course, you should think about, or I mean, me from a method side, we should think about propagating those uncertainties into the differential expression calculation. 
And we're, we're working on this. I'm sure lots of other people are working on this. And we think we have uh, kind of a good approach to make use of the bootstraps. I'm not going to tell you about it today. Um, but but uh, there's more to come there. And of course, we're not the only ones working on this. Um, OK, I already mentioned this point. Uh, the full alignments are useful. Um, last thing is that the, there's, uh, as part of this collaboration with Mike Love, uh, we created, uh, when I say we, I mean Mike Love created the TX import package. Now, this TX import is uh, the, the bridge between the estimators, the transcript level estimators, so Sam and Callisto, RSEM, all these, these estimators, and the other layer, which is the statistical layer, which is DEC2 and EDGEOT, or, or uh, uh, VU and LIMA. Um, so, so just to, to let you know that that exists, and I think it was just last week, it's now available in the developed version of Bioconductor. Okay, so I will uh, end there, and thank, of course, Charlotte Sonnison, who did the majority of, of the work here, also Mike Love. Um, and then there's lots of other people in my group that are kind of related in these projects, Chaudet, and Gosia, and Lucas, uh, that are involved in quite heavily in RNA seq data. Um, and of course, the, the, the Agile development team, which is Gordon uh, and Yunshin in, in Melbourne, and Davis, who's in Cambridge now. And then also thank the, the funding agencies for uh, supporting these people in these projects. And thank you for listening. <laughs>